student unions and black studies departments appeared in most northern colleges with a significant black population. This inspired other uh, groups to form studies departments, La Raza, Asian, American, Latino, etc. There were major historical works which were published by the likes of African American scholar Chancellor Williams, who did the destruction of black civilization, uh, Diop, and also at UNESCO, which was in 1974, Diop and his Congolese disciple, Obenga, uh, defeated an elite team of European Egyptologists and anthropologists and established that ancient Egypt and Nubia were actually black African civilizations. So they had been kind of denying that for a while. The movement went international. In 1974, the African community sent delegations to the sixth Pan-African Conference, which was in Tanzania. In 1977, there was FESTAC, which was in Nigeria. And it was during a time when African Americans were going back uh, to Africa to study and work. Rap and associated culture, hip hop, was started in 1973 by DJ Cool Herc. I had a chance to meet him on a tour. When you go to New York, you can go on a tour of the roots of hip hop. And also that was when Zulu Nation started. So all of the musical influences which black people have been initiating all along, also was really on the rise during the 70s. There was a dramatic increase in black actors and actresses in movies. Um, that's when kind of some conscious and humorous films came out, The Spook Who Sat By The Door, Cool World, etc. So it was like a, I would say, a movement that had spiritual roots that manifested in a variety of ways that included education, politics, economics, culture, consciousness, actually. And so our panelists were going to just speak to um, their involvement, what they were engaged in. Really, we're overall, we're trying to tell the whole Nairobi story, but we need each of you involved in the telling of that story. So before I actually start with Warren on the line, just so I know where we're headed at the end, how many people were active in the 1970s and might want to say something at some point. Just trying to get an idea of people in the audience. So we're considering um, just gravitating right into that conversation um, where we allow people in the audience to speak to their experience during that era as opposed to breaking up into groups. But if you'll uh, let us do what we normally do, we kind of go with the flow and the art and the creativity of it but we certainly want to be able to hear from you because you possess part of the story. So, Talala. Hello. Talala. So, yes. Oh, okay. He's, he's apt and paying attention. Thank you for that. So I'm going to start with Warren. You ready? I'm ready. Great. We're listening. My regrets that I'm not able to be there in person but thanks to who uh, <clears throat> I'm able to be Skyped in. I want to thank this couple of Eastside Prep and Brian White here in Morgan State. My challenge was to talk about public education in the 70s. And Wait, just one moment. Just one moment. Um, Kill the, kill the two mics that are closest to the young to this. Okay. You okay? We just want to fix the mic because we're getting some feedback. Yeah. So we All need right. to turn. Point away. Just point them away because they're, they're picking up, they're picking up the sound from the uh, from the uh, laptop. Okay. Try it. All right. Yeah. 
And as I said, my job was to speak to public education in our own community in the 1970s. Uh, my two reference points were my work as principal of Valley School from 1968 to 1971, and then as superintendent of labor with the district from 1973 to 1978. I think the best way to describe education in the 70s in the Nairobi community using Bell Haven as a starting point was the school was in the community, not in the community, but of the community. So the school took its uh, direction from the Bell Haven community. And some of the features that I think are important to be considered now in 2019 given what is happening in public education communities of color. There were no suspensions or exhaustions. Uh, we did not suspend students from school because our philosophy was school was made to keep people uh, in. No office referrals for discipline. Teachers were responsible for their uh, discipline. We tried to create a positive learning environment. We did something that I thought was very unique, and that is we had what we call a five-day student week and a four-day teaching week. On Fridays, we had entrance day, and students were able to participate in their areas of interest, which include pop, music, drama, sports, sewing, cooking, etc. We used that as a that backdrop for students developing their own dramatic presentations and themes once a month. So they developed the script, they developed the background, et cetera, et cetera. W.E.B. Du Bois talked about the talented tenth. We also created a program that we called uh, ACE, Academic and Cultural Enrichment. So I use professionals from the community. Mawada taught mathematics, Lala taught by the late Faye Knox, by Healy, et cetera, et cetera. So we got a group of fifth and sixth graders together and they work with these outside professionals in these particular areas. We also had an opportunity to visit Washington, D.C., uh, Harlem, New York, uh, places like that so they could get a feel for what black communities are really uh, all about. We also had an opportunity to uh, require the teachers had to visit the homes of the students and their classes the first week of the school, first three weeks of school. If the parents did not want them to visit, then the parents would come to the school. So again, the school was of the community, not just in the community. Another interesting feature, given the relationship between the police and the black community, we did not allow the police to come on campus to arrest anyone during the school day. We also developed what I call resource allocation based on need or equity. So you may be teaching fourth grade, but you wouldn't need a fourth grade social studies textbook if the students were reading on the second grade level. So I locked all the books up in the library and you tell me how you're going to use them, what your needs are. In fact, I transferred a lot of the books to Menlo Oaks because the students there were uh, able to use those particular books. That's just some of what we did at Bell Haven. Uh, and I was fortunate to have people working with me who were very supportive of this notion that the school was up the community and not just in the community. In 1973, I was superintendent of Ravenwood City School District. And there's something first that I think I want to mention in relationship to the district. The first African-American superintendent in California was John Mondo, who was a superintendent of schools of Ravenwood City School District, prior to my being appointed. 
Ravenwood School District produced the first black school, the first in the area, maybe the first in the nation. I know we were the first in the nation to recognize Malcolm X's birthday at the uh, holiday. And then there are three other areas that I want to focus on that came out of my involvement with the role of superintendent. In the superintendent's cabinet, we had four Stanford PhDs who were part of the academy, cabinet, excuse me, who not only had PhDs from Stanford, but they lived in the community. And three of them still live in the community. In fact, I spoke to Dr. T. L. W. Thomasine Life for Wilson this morning. Uh, I would hope some of you would visit with her and run me. She's had some health challenges and she wasn't able to uh, attend. The three areas that I think are most important to talk about in terms of uh, my role as superintendent, one was the community family philosophy. Secondly, community family guided education. And then thirdly, community boards. I'll start with the latter. Each school and children's center had the opportunity to create their own governing board. Full policy uh, authorization, uh, given way, of course, to the education code. So this was an example and outgrowth of the community control notion that arrives after the civil rights movement. But this was unique in that it was very different from what happened at I School one in New York, what happened at most communities in Washington, D.C., and what happened in Detroit that they call community councils. The boards were staffed by majority parents elected by the parents of the community where the school was located. The boards also include representatives from the professional staff as well as the support staff elected by their constituencies. We also changed the language. Uh, Tony Morrison has been very adamant about the power of language. So I heard Helen Harvey wave at me. So we didn't call Helen a teacher's aide. She was a community teacher. She taught, she lived in the community, and therefore she had uh, a number of, excuse me, attributes to give to the students based on our role in the community. We had community principals in addition to the professional assistant principal. These were also people who lived in the community. The power of language gave them authority and also recognition and that the students and the parents and the community looked up to them on an equal basis. The thrust of this whole notion of community family, community family guided education, and community for the collaborative decision, decision making. In the 1990s, a cultural conceptual framework for educating African American students was titled, uh, I'm blanking. Cultural Responsive Teaching. Interestingly enough, two of the three original uh, advocates for cultural responsive teaching, Etta Hollins, Gloria Lass Willis, all started at Ravenwood City School District under my administration. Gloria Lass Willis built the Green Keepers, which is a classic and educating African-American children documents teachers from what was then Kavanaugh Elementary School. She's still a close friend of mine. She just retired from the University of, of Wisconsin. If you look at cultural responsive teaching and attendance, they mirror what we did in 1973 under the term community family guided education. And finally, I think my charge is what are the implications of all of this to the year 2019 and beyond? I think it's safe to say that we were way ahead of our time. 
we did things in an uncharacteristic characteristic way, but we made a difference in students' lives. So I think what we, got, what we contributed will now be considered changing the conversation about urban school reform. And the first three questions that need to be raised, who controls the schools that our children attend? The second question, who should control those schools? And the third question would be, what should be the relationship between schools and communities? I think it was George Washington Collins who said, people who do common things in an uncommon way will make a dent in the community and the community at large. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I can't see everybody there, but I'm sure there are a lot of people there who see me and know that I appreciate you for all you did to support. Thank you very much. Warren, thank you so much. Uh, you wanted to ask him a quick question? He missed the names of the two people who, I know Gloria is like world renowned, right? For culturally responsive education. But we yes. you know, miss the two names. Etta Hollins. Etta is now retired and in Southern California. Gloria Lassabilin became the national president of ARA. She was succeeded by Joyce King, who was also from the community family. Um, and I have the pleasure now of working with her daughter here in Baltimore. Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you so much for that. What we'll do, if that's okay with you, we'll let each person speak. All right. If you have questions, just note them down <coughs> so that you yeah. can ask when you we're with all the Go ahead. He might want to ask. Go ahead. Something now. But, uh, wow. If you have a question now? No. Okay. <laughs> Who is? Does someone have a burning question now? No, I have a burning question. Who is that sitting? <laughs> Well, you can't be just out of order. <laughs> wow. We're, we're blinded up here, but it's, it's just great. Yeah, but I can make out a little bit. But it's just so great to see all of you here. I got my nose, but that's no biggie. Thanks for the Hey, you want to use your I'll be I just want to say, Warren, take care of yourself for this week's. There's still work to do, and we need people like you and Bob and others to hang around a little bit longer while we get these youngsters together. Because, you know, one of the things that, you know, that I've always said and that I learned from people like them is that you have to train people for leadership. And if we don't, do that, then we're going to fail as a nation of, uh, of us black people. So we still have a little bit of training to do, and we've done a lot of training. And the other thing that I, you know, uh, that was said is that uh, a wise man once told me that uh, you may never see the fruits of your labor. And Bob, I want to tell you that you were wrong. He's, he's the one who told me that. That's why I work like I work like heck you know, because I wanted to see some of the deeds of my labor, and he was the one who told me that, and, and it inspired me to work and do the work that must be done in the community. And uh, you know, and and uh, you know, Nairobi College allowed me to do that. Uh, I have a checkered past. I guess you could call it that. Because when I came to Nairobi, when I came to Nairobi College, I was always in the Nairobi community. And I left and I went to San Francisco State. So, uh, and uh, we tried to destroy the state college system at San Francisco State. And that's another subject that you may want to, we'll, we may be able to talk about later. 
We tried at San Francisco State to just take over and create a, B, a, a, a black student union and a black studies program within that system. But in 1969, a small group of uh, students from CSM and the, the college readiness program, they were uh, a little bit, I think, more bolder at that time. And they went out and wanted to create a college. And uh, they went out with you know, those students, and they answered the call uh, to the educational crisis that existed in the Bay Area at that time. And that crisis was is that we saw that the state system and the public school system was in shambles. And uh, if uh, we were going to survive and if we were going to thrive in this, then we had to uh, create our own institutions. A lot of it stemmed uh, from, and as I said this morning, we had a uh, the MEE, Mothers for Equal Education, the sneak out program, and then Bob then made the decisions to create the school system K through 12. And we said that we can do, go even a little further. So we came up with, the students came up with that idea of creating our own uh, institutions. Uh, at State, they issued a, a, you know, a list of 15 demands to the powers of be. They set out to develop a community student-oriented college designed to stir ethnic communities and to educate people of color. That's what Nairobi College did. And you can understand the climate at that time. We had uh, Ronald Reagan was the governor. Tricky Dick was the president, and uh, the uh, administration, you know, in the college, and we had to deal with the Western Association of Schools and Colleges. Uh, they're the ones who certify you and, and uh, grant you accreditation. So those were the forces that were, you know, against us when we were trying to do that. Uh, in, but in spite of that, in fall of 1965, with those few students, uh, Nairobi College opened. And it opened in uh, the fall of 1969 in SPA. We had a sister college in uh, Redwood City. I don't know if most of you remember Vince Ramos. Vince Ramos, uh, their main intent was they wanted to make a they wanted to make revolution. They wanted to, you know, they were more about uh, armed struggle and, you know, different uh, philosophy than Nairobi College had had. We wanted to educate our children and our community for the future. Uh, we started, I'm going to tell you what we started with. When Nairobi College started, uh, we attracted people, and I don't know how. We didn't have the internet, and we didn't have a... Facebook and all of those, but we attracted people from all over the country uh, and Africa. And I think that was due to some of the people that we had working with us, uh, the homos and uh, even Hank and different people who were uh, our ambassadors and who went out and uh, uh, interacted with people from different places all over. And I really do mean all over the world. Uh, we created programs that never existed. You heard Bob say this morning that we had a program with Stanford where our students were allowed to uh, uh, take courses at Stanford University and they had a library card. They had full library privileges at Stanford University. We had four students who went to a master's program with Antioch. We created a program with uh, we, uh, Oberlin College, uh, we uh, did two tours of Africa to, with our students and to let them see in other parts of the world and what was going on. So they, you know, they, they would broaden their uh, perspective on, on things. So there, uh, we started with 20 volunteers, one staff person. Uh, and within a very short period of time, we rapidly grew to uh, an enrollment of uh, 250 to 300 students. 
and in the spring, and that increased, uh, we had, uh, I think, uh, 30 full-time and part-time teaching staff. We had over 30 different programs. We had a lot of firsts at Nairobi College. We were the first ones to start an infant care center in the state. We had uh, the uh, Project Dig It, where we uh, had a 36-foot band, and we went to different high schools throughout the Bay Area. We worked with students to place them in colleges and universities all over the country. We started with them when they were, you had to start, we started with them when they were sophomores and worked with them up until they graduated in their senior years. Uh, we uh, had uh, the NARO the NVM, anybody can remember NVM. We have some people who uh, uh, are still using those skills to this day. They're licensed plumbers, electricians, and carpenters who went through that program and we certified them. We had the first, uh, well, maybe Biak was one of the first. Uh, we uh, certified uh, teachers to license them in uh, child care. And I said we had the infant daycare, the infant center where we took kids at two and a half months <coughs> to two years. Nothing like that had ever been done. And then uh, uh, as people talked about this morning, uh, that how drugs hit our community, how hard our community was hit with the drug epidemic. We created a program called Babies Born with Addictions, and uh, that program lasted all of those. So you can see why uh, the powers to be thought it in their best interest that Nairobi College had to close. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things, and we were just recapping where we started. We started uh, out, I think, what do we say in, uh, I think we started, we had a 805 running me. Then we moved over to the, yeah, then we did, we moved over to the uh, Nairobi Village Shopping Center and we had offices there. Uh, then we just kept growing and then we finally moved to 635 Donahue and as we said, a few minutes ago, I said, I'm, I asked somebody how many offices, I asked James Walker, how many offices did we have? We said 20. I said, no, I think it was more like 20. I mean, 30 offices. And we moved into that complex and we, uh, we had uh, those 30 offices and we just continued to grow and expand our programs. Well, Ravenswood High School closed and, and this is one of the important uh, aspects of the whole college area. When they, Ravenswood High School closed, I think Reynolds was the superintendent and he offered us the high school. <clears throat> Naturally, we moved into the high school and we had all of the classroom facilities and all of the offices and we began to continue to operate. At the same time, we were constantly being attacked by the Western Association of Schools and Colleges who kept introducing issues that, uh, you know, we were violating our charter. Uh, they always raised the question, which they are still doing today with black colleges throughout the country of financial stability. Well, when we talked this morning about how we, uh, you know, raise money. Bob said he had to get into his fundraising mode, which he had never done before. And we raised money. We were able to raise money through Gene Worth, who gave us a, uh, a uh, uh, declining grant. I think, Bob, uh, it started at about 500000 and it went down each year. Uh, and Bob told a story about how her daughter, he was introduced, but the real story was is that the woman was in love with Bob. <laughs> no, no, that, that's, that's not true. <laughs> She was a strange woman. Bob went to visit her on a day that it rained, and she thought that was a message to her to do whatever he said. So she was generous enough to, to give us that grant. Uh, no, 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 no. Jean Weaver. 
And so she, uh, you know, and that's how, you know, we were able to raise money from different places. Uh, we had the, uh, uh, the TRIO programs, and there was money coming in from the TRIO programs. And uh, we uh, were able to just generate funds. When that didn't work, they finally came at us with, uh, we violated our charter. We said that we were an institution without walls. And we eventually moved into a, uh, a complex. And so that was uh, uh, one of the things that they threw at us. The other thing that I don't think that, that helped us at all was Donald DeFreeze. <clears throat> Does anybody know who Donald DeFreeze was? Donald DeFreeze was uh, CIMQ head of the Simeonese Liberation Army. <laughs> So, uh, and no, a lot of you don't know that he was a roommate, the Patty Hearst kidnapping. He was a roommate with one of our reentry program uh, persons. And he visited East Palo Alto, and somehow they realized that he had visited East Palo Alto which prompted me to have a lot of FBI interviews, you know, on a constant basis. But one of the things that he did was, is that he would send these messages and he would, I, he would tell us, and people don't notice, this is the first time that it's been told, that he would tell us where those messages were. We did not want to be involved. But he named Nairobi College, you remember Bob? Mm -hmm. He said, I want Nairobi College to oversee this distribution of food to the poor and, and the distribution. Your mother, Dolores, helped put that together. And we we uh, had a food distribution center. But not only in East Palo Alto, we did this. And we were involved because he asked us, he said he wanted us involved. So we met with Randolph Hearst and uh, some of his folks, and uh, we told them at that time when they got wind of this, they cut off our funds for the TRIO program. Mm -hmm. So Randolph Hearst approached us and said that he needed our help. We said, we can't help, <laughs> not unless we get some of our money back. <laughs> and so Randolph Hearst, Hearst called Casper Weinberg, who was in Washington, and told them, find them some money. The next day, we had $100,000, just like that. And, and, and uh, we went ahead and we helped with the food distribution program. Uh, we worked with Ludlow Kramer, and we worked in the old China Basin in San Francisco. They set up a warehouse, and the rest is history. You know about that, uh, the food distribution program. So those are some of the things that led up to and uh, cause increased pressure on the college. But given all of the, and I wish I had my notes here, I do have some, but given all of the things that uh, we were doing with Nairobi College, the uh, exchange program with Oberlin, Goddard, Antioch, Stanford, CB, we helped create the Council of Institu uh, uh, Independent Black Institution. We had a program called, and I don't know if anybody remembers, the Educational Financial Reform Project. We had all of these projects, and then someone this morning mentioned, and I almost forgot that they went through the Leadership Development Program at Nairobi College. Who said? I there, did. Uh, Dana. Dana went through the Leadership Development Program at Nairobi College. These were, we were way ahead of our time, and one of the things that Warren and I talk about all the time and others talk about is uh, how people are trying, they're reinventing the wheel. They're attempting to do the things that we have done. That's why this is so important that, that we document this history, that we come out of this with something tangible that we can use and, uh, uh, and people can study from that and not make the, and I don't think we, yeah, we made some mistakes, but, uh, and uh, but we learn from those, and I think that people, if they listen, 
they learn from what we have done and what we attempted to do that, uh, you know, we can save a lot of grief and a lot of people can uh, replicate the, some of the things that we did all over this country. Some of the things that Warren and them did in the school district that, that we did, the Teen Summer Project, and we can't uh, diminish that at that, and we have to talk about how important that was and how a lot of the things that came out of it. I brought a book with me uh, today called Patterns in Reading, and uh, I don't know if y'all know who, what that is. Uh, Mary Hoover wrote that book, and uh, Deborah Daniels, and uh, there are just numerous of people who contributed. And we were just very blessed that we came along at a time when the black community, the black nation, uh, were uh, operating in the spirit of a cohesive togetherness. We uh, had people, brothers, who we could call our brothers all over the country. J2 Wawusi out of New York. Don Lee, who is, what's Don Lee's name? Hakim Matabuti. We all were working together and, and, and creating programs, and Nairobi College was in the forefront of that. So the powers to be did, you know, they, they felt that it really was in their best interest that we not be around. Mm -hmm. But that it, the remnants and the things are still here and we can still use them. Uh, and you may have questions. If you do have questions, we be, I would be more than willing to answer those questions. It was a, a struggle and it's, uh, you know, all of the things that we've done is uh, in, in two days and in 15 minutes, you're never going to be able to capture all of it. But it'll, you'll get the flavor. And then from some of your interviews with Jesse and people, we are hoping that we can put together something that people can use throughout the country. Uh, and that's basically uh, all I got. That's a lot. Okay, I'm on. Okay, uh, my name is Fred Powell. Uh, I've been confused a lot with Fred Howell. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good thing. So that's that's been the case since I've been here uh, in East Palo Alto and that Romy. Um, I'm originally from uh, Houston, Texas. Uh, actually, when I left, it was just called Acres Home. Um, I grew up in an all-black community. I never saw a white person <laughs> until, uh, until I saw them on TV. I went down to the only black theater in, in Houston uh, to see a movie or something. Uh, but yeah, we came out here, uh, that was five of us, in 1967 uh, and started at the, we were, we were dropped in San Mateo. Uh, we all were wearing high water pants. And, uh, we had Ivy League haircuts, sort of like what I have now. <laughs> and, um, you know, just, just dropped into, uh, you know, sort of seemed like a nation of white folks. Uh, and we were immediately taken to the college readiness program where we met Bob and Jean and Sally uh, Smith and Doug Barker was around and uh, his brother and some other folks. Um, Clyde Barker. Um, so we were we were part of the uh, program and we got involved and. I was a tutor supervisor and we had tutors also in the program and everything was going great uh, for a while, for a minute, and, uh, and all of a sudden, like all I can remember is we were involved in a, uh, a riot, people were tearing up the place, and uh, the police came in and we thought we, 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 we were all going to get shot, but uh, it was it was calmed down. and. What I remember next is that we we all left. Um, 
at the time I had applied to, I had been there two years, we left in 69, I think, and I applied to a couple of schools to transfer um, and got accepted at Stanford. And some of my other buddies came out from Texas. I think Don was at Stanford. Um, one of our buddies went back to Texas. He got accepted at San Jose State, but he eventually went back to Texas. He couldn't take it. There's too much going on out here. <laughs> too much. So, um, unfortunately, uh, when I started Stanford, I, I, um, I got married. I thought I was doing good because most of my high school buddies, they, some of them dropped out. They had kids before they got out of high school. And I thought, oh, I'm two years of college. I'm doing good. So by the time I was at Stanford, I was married with a kid. So while I was at Stanford, I was working part-time. I was taking a full-time load. And I also started teaching at Nairobi College. I was teaching a math class. Bubba, you remember that, right? <laughs> so uh, I also did some drawings. Uh, Bob had asked me to come in and do some drawings on a place where they were holding the school. And eventually he asked me to do a library and a science facility. So I did, I did, a, I did a, uh, a brochure while I was up at, I had transferred to UC Berkeley by then. And I did a brochure that and I put together. It's, it's, it's really student quality, so. <laughs> so um, this was for fundraising. And we could pass it around. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, because uh, during that time, I, I taught at Nairobi and I was taking martial arts. And um, when I got up to UC Berkeley, I went to, I went to Ghana because when Bob asked me to do this and inspired me to look into uh, designs for African people. To, I wanted to develop something of my own to symbolize African architecture. And so I went back, back there to sort of uh, look at what were the influential symbols in the country. Um, there was a, a black architect uh, by the name of, uh, I think it was Ken Simmons, who had done a library in um, Bogotan which was Northern Ghana. So I went to see that. And, um, anyway, I, I got some ideas and I came back and I finished up the library and science building. Um, but I remember those days because they had, a, they had a huge impact on how I studied architecture. Because when I started at Stanford, you know, they were teaching me history. They were showing all these huge cathedrals in Europe and, you know, these monster <laughs> things. And then I went to Africa and you see these huts. <laughs> and there, was a lot of, there was a lot of meaning behind um, how the things, they were laid out because most of the living was done outside. And the, the huts were actually used just for sleeping. Um, <coughs> And then when I went to Northern Africa, I saw the underground um, developments where they use building into the ground to control uh, the heat that was there. So, and, and, and the hillside uh, housing that they built. Uh, so this was more of an education for me than anything else that I learned in school. Yep. So, um, I, when I was at Berkeley, I turned it into uh, sort of a independent study classes. And I got other students involved. So I went back to Africa in 77 um, to Northern Africa. So, but um, I love working at Nairobi College and teaching and getting, getting the students motivating um, 
of the students to get involved in architecture. Because when I when I got accepted at Stanford, I was I was accepted in engineering, and I switched over to architecture because I like to draw a lot. Um, and then I when I started working at Nairobi, I got more interested in the sort of uh, cultural aspects of of the whole Institute of Architecture. So I was able to travel to. Ghana, Ivory Coast, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco. I wanted to go to Egypt, but I ran out of money. <laughs> so, so after that, I, after graduating from UC Berkeley, I worked at the design center where they provided free architecture to African American and minority neighborhoods. And I was there for four years. So. Um, then after that, I went to VBN for six years, and I was a partner there, or associate partner. And, I, and after that, I worked for a black firm in San Francisco. And that's why we came back to East Palo Alto um, to work on the senior center. I did the senior center up here uh, with Gertrude Wills. Um, that was uh, a new facility. And, we're currently, I have my own firm now, we're currently working on the city council chambers uh, downtown. So, uh, <laughs> 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 university, <laughs> university, right, right by McDonald's. <laughs> you know that apartment, McDonald's downtown. <laughs> <laughs> so Bob and I, I kept in touch with Bob the whole time I've been in California and sort of uh, kept him in touch with the group of us that came from Houston and um, and I worked also with Al Nelson, Bubba Nelson who's in the audience on some projects because um, he was he's involved in architecture as well. What I, I liked about the whole experience is that uh, it, because when, when I first got out here, I mean, we, we, were, we were raising all black community. We didn't know anything about black power and uh, all we knew, we were supposed to stay in our lane. And uh, so when I got out here, I, I really was excited about the movement and identifying and trying to educate ourselves and I just jumped in with both feet to educate myself. I'm still working on a family tree to try to figure out where we came from. I know where most of us came from West Africa. So, um, but it's been a, it's been a, a great experience for me. Working with this guy <laughs> and Bob. So, uh, that's all I have. It's the fruit. This is some fruit. <laughs> and I have I have five grandkids. Whoa. Two of them want to come down here and do some work. And, uh, they're trying to get into Stanford. And they want to be doctors. All right. All right. For those who might not know, in my travel to many places, I have met many black faces in visiting or living in some of these black ghettos. Everyone is always originally from someplace else other than where they have settled. But what we all have a tendency to forget to say is that we are originally from Africa. Mm -hmm. Now let me tell you about my dance at Nairobi College. Mm -hmm. I had come to Nairobi College in 1970. After graduating from Ravenswood High School, I went on to um, a four-year university in Forest Grove, Oregon, uh, known as Pacific University. That was quite a cultural shock to me. 
because I too am around too many white people uh, growing up in Brooklyn, New York and had been a black community environment. And then coming to East Palo Alto, it's a black community environment. I like being in a black community environment. So it was just too much for me to have to deal with that. So you know, it affects the studying and um, people are nice and all, but it was just that I was just questioning, like, is this what's gonna happen to the human spirit? Is that you can't be with your own people. You have to just get and go with the flow and just go anywhere, one way or the other. So that was the question I had to pose to myself. But when I come back to East Palo Alto after that one year of college, um, I'm going to be living with my father. And um, he's the one that's responsible for bringing me and my sister out here. Uh, this is in a time when it was very unheard of of a black man bringing his two girl children to come live with him. And his premise was he did not want us to grow up in Brooklyn without that father figure and have anything happen to us before our time. You know what that means. And so my, my sister and I, we waited a long time before we had our children. Well, I waited longer than she did, but anyway, that's okay. It worked out all right. Um, so I, I grew up in an environment where it was a multi-generational um, family structure in Brooklyn, New York. And so I'm used to things working out on all kinds of fronts for a, a family lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And uh, coming to Nairobi College, of course, I eventually learned that this was the way of our people. So uh, yeah, it was a beautiful thing. But you know, I did encounter people who just wouldn't be with the program. You know, they didn't like that. Okay, so they've gotten all this education and the main thing is that you want to get yourself ready to make a whole lot of money, have the fanciest cars, um, just always have the best kind of uh, children that you're going to produce. And, um, but in terms of community involvement and engagement, that's not something that you're going to really spend a lot of time on because, you know, it don't make no money, so they say. Mm -hmm. um, so when I get to Nairobi College, I'm attracted to Nairobi College not only to continue on with my education because it's the expectation for me, for my family, that I have to be educated. And, and of course, it's going to be lifelong. And so I want to do good and honor my family to get that done. So yes, when I come back here, there's a two-year college, no, it's not really college. So yeah, I'm going to sign up and be a part of that. And um, what I found out is that once you come to Nairobi College, the Nairobi way is you ain't never going to leave. You're always going to stay. You know, you're going to be developing so many skills at the same time that it's just going to be unbelievable. One day I just decided to take time out of my life to just think about, like, what did I do at Nairobi College? And I found out that one, in one time, at one time, these are all the things that I was. I was a student, I was a youth community tutor, I was an English teacher, a poet in residence, a vocalist songwriter, a performing artist, assistant registrar, and on the board of trustees at Nairobi College. And um, somehow, I got all this kind of stuff done. It never occurred to me about being tired. It never occurred to me that I ain't gonna like this. It never occurred to me that I'm not gonna get paid for all these things. It was just like a, a honor and a duty to be able to serve my people. So whatever it took to make it happen, I was willing to do it. And to this day, I'm still that way for a lot of people who know me. You know, I'm just right there to be for whatever we need to have done uh, for our people and to help things get done. Um, then the other thing that happened was I became a member of um, the Nairobi Messengers. So to me, culture is very important to our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, it, it's what helps us to keep flying high. It helps us to keep carrying on. It helps us to um, know and appreciate and respect all those who came before us. Um, Lakeba and I went to um, Merced. UC Merced had a black arts movement a reunion of sort. And uh, the tragic thing that had happened was, just as this uh, conference is going to happen, um, Amiri Baraka passed away. And the organizer felt that she just 
She was just too through. She just didn't believe this could even happen. We were the ones that were counseling her to let her know, no, we got, we got to keep on, because we come from a background where this is what you do. You have to keep going on. We, our people, our ancestors have shown us that whatever happens in life, you have to keep going. You got to keep it pushing. You don't, yes, you're going to feel sad. You're not going to like how it happened. You didn't predict it. You don't control it. But, you know, it's so many counting on you and so many people looking to make sure that you take care of that load that needs to be taken care of. And it's only at that conference that we both become aware that actually Nairobi College, and in particular Nairobi Messengers, were looked at as a very important part of the Black Arts Movement. Because for us, we were just doing the work as the Nairobi Messenger. We considered ourselves to be um, uh, ambassadors for Nairobi College. We went on tours and trips to tell the story of Nairobi College and tell the story of our history of our people using the arts. Um, and so we, um, the thing that I loved the most about this group was that we were all students. We had Joan Newby, who is now an ancestor and no longer with us, and Boone Layla Wobogo was the musical um, uh, director of uh, our group. And we all had a good time being together. And as students, we were not only studying all the grace before us, but we had opportunities to be able to create our own original work. And uh, because we are from original people, so it's only right that we should be doing things like that. So I got to be known as the poet in residence there at the, the school and through Nairobi Messages because I was very prolific in writing poetry all the time. And then I got to sing and then an offshoot of all poets, of course, is some of us who want to develop this talent and skill, we can become songwriters as well, also being vocalists on projects. And while we were there with the Nairobi Messengers, uh, it turned out that it was a group that came called the Sons of Light. And the Sons of Light started looking at um, primarily three of us, three of the sisters in the Nairobi Messages in particular, because of our voicing and our arrangement and the way we sounded when we were performing. And um, it was uh, the Sons of Light. And then they came to us, and the next thing we know is that they decided that they're going to talk to me, they're going to talk to Lakiba Pittman, and they're going to talk to Jeannie Cuffey Tatum and ask us to come be with them because they were getting ready to go into recording studio and perform uh, and create this whole album called Let the Sun Shine In. And so uh, we were very excited about it, and it turned out we did go in and join it. So one day we were all together talking, and uh, by this time the working name of the group is Sons of Light. So I had to raise the issue. How could we be sons of light and we're female? And then, mm, they hadn't thought about that. So, so uh, because of that questioning, the group name was changed to Sons and Daughters of Light. And the thing I want you to know about this is that we didn't know it at the time, but apparently we have done something very remarkable with that CD. Not only did we go, what well, was an album then when we released it in 1978, but not only did we get to travel under that name of Sons and Daughters of Light, we now have, uh, by 1999, uh, negotiations happened with Ubiquity Records, and now we, that album is now a CD. <laughs> and I just got notified about a month ago, somebody from France wrote me to ask if I could get an original copy of the album because he's an album collector which we, we don't have it and we can't do it. And I did tell him about the CD and he said, yeah, I know that, but I was out. <laughs> so that was really interesting. So I'm talking to Ubiquity Records to ask them to you know, respond to this person who wants to be there. And what caused us to come back around again was that they had been a very popular London DJ uh, uh, who actually was using our music in dance clubs and made us very, very popular, not only in London, but in Japan. And we understand it was in Sweden, so we haven't traveled to any of those places, but you know, the work did continue and it did travel. And, then, and so when I think about Nairobi College, I sure do sometimes, so, ooh, I just wish we could have 
went on and been recorded as the Nairobi Messengers, and that never was able to be done. Um, but as, as the creator would have it, sometimes those misses might happen, but that doesn't stop any member of a group to still move forward. So what happened to me, I decided to um, go and found, I found out that the National Black United Front actually had a record project going on where they were asking for songwriters throughout the United States to actually go into a recording studio, become your own producer, and arrange your whole setup, get your own musicians, um, do whatever you need to do to produce this song and submit it to Kansas City for the input. And I did that, and I was one of only a very few people that were actually able to get four of my own recordings on four different uh, national albums. So that did happen. So now in my future, well, of course, I want to make sure now, before I leave the planet, that I actually do have a compilation of my work in some one setting and one, one product uh, that would also include poetry as well as have my, um, my voicing on it as a uh, uh, vocalist as well. So I continued to dream, I didn't, uh, I didn't stop. And I had to live life like everybody else and I just decided that I saw and noticed that the arts was not only just fulfilling for me personally, but I just liked how it was able to help enhance um, and uh, help make some changes and help elevate the conditions of our people in this world. And then um, the other thing that happened to me, I decided to look at some of the things that I remember from my time at Nairobi College and the effects that had happened at the college. And I found out and realized that I, to me, I think it gave uh, a legitimacy of an African viewpoint. Um, yes, we do have one, and we have a right to have one. And we can express it as much as possible in every way that we can, especially in our daily life. That's all to the good. Um, we embrace African culture and heritage from a position of pride and strength uh, and not shame. Um, we learned early on that our history did not start as slavery. We are not, slavery is not the beginning of our existence as a people. We go way back, we are an ancient people. So we got a chance to study that. And you can just imagine what that does for a person when you know these kinds of things, you know? And also be encouraged to keep going. Don't just stop because you just were in college for this period of time and then you're gonna go the rest of your life and just talk about that, for, <laughs> that period of time. It's always things coming up. Just the other day I looked at the news and now they found some things um, in some bodies of waters of Egyptian temples or things underneath the water and stuff. So see, Africans just keep rising all the time. That's all I can tell you. Um, we're uh, educators uh, from many parts of the United States. Um, that also happened uh, for Nairobi College. Uh, we did attract people from all over the world to come and be a part of our thing, as well as being uh, people from Stanford University. Uh, they came and also helped us at work. Um, the uh, community had a number of buildings and organizations named with Nairobi, being uh, Nairobi Day School, Nairobi Shopping Center, Joe's Nairobi Lounge. I'm still trying to work on that lounge thing because you know everybody know me. Like I always tell people, what, watch the time. You know, watch the time. I don't like you be messing with my eight o'clock, nine o'clock time. But I'm trying to get a club somewhere. <laughs> but we don't have those. You know, this is not right. You know, remember we used to have all these clubs now. Now we don't, and don't nobody do house parties. That's the only thing we do with house parties. So we, but we have a right to have a nightlife here in East Palo Alto. And that's another one of those things on my list that I'm trying to do. Um, and then, um, I'll let you know, oh, you might be in the building. Build. OK, I'll put this in your mind. Anyway, um, um, we put the world on notice that East Palo Alto is known as a community of activists. And, um, this is very, very important. I mean, I can go places and meet people, and as soon as I say I'm from East Palo, East Palo Alto, you mean Nairobi? And you know, we're known. You know, there was a, a student who worked out at Stanford University who came and he found out about East Palo Alto being named Nairobi, and he happened to come from Nairobi, and he got interested. He winds up doing an article got Lakiba, me, uh, Dr. Faye McNair, and a number of other people. Mado Pello, he's mentioning us because he met with us to talk about 
that time that we lived uh, in that was known as Nairobi. And he was just stunned, you know, to, wow, another, another place outside of Nairobi is being made in Nairobi. He made a big thing out of that. And it helped me, Nairobi College really did help me to uh, establish and launch my own career as a performing artist um, and a cultural artist. So now these days I'm known as an activist and an advocate. Um, not only am I uh, performing a lot and teaching, um, I'm being a, a good resource to artists, but I support these artists. You know, I'm always promoting them in social media and I go to a lot of things, I get invited to a lot of places and I have to tell them sometimes I just can't make all that kind of stuff because to me it's so important to get the word out about things that's going on. And I'm running a whole gamut from community things all the way up to cultural arts things. And I'm meeting all of these world famous jazz and blues, that's my thing, jazz and blues artists. And I'm coming up with creative ways to be able to promote them one of the things that's concerning me the most is that I'm very concerned about our elders. Um, this society is still bad about that, with this age thing. You know, you, you did a lot, the time comes in your life in your 80s and 90s, and I'm hanging out with people in this age range now. And it's sad to see how they don't feel like they have gotten their real props that they should. So I think anything that we can do to honor them while they're here, it's good that we talk about people when they're dead and gone, but it is important to let people know right here and now how much they're uh, revered and honored. Um, when I heard Bob talk not too long ago about his age, it's, well, I couldn't believe it. Why? Because I like the idea that when we were coming up in Nairobi College, everybody seemed so young, you know? We didn't, we didn't have this sense of oldness at all. <laughs> it was just a beautiful thing. And one time I, I met um, Sister uh, Lily McDonald. I'll never forget her. She stopped me in the street one time. She said, Chache, I'm so happy to see you. And I said, oh, me too, like that now. And I'm, I'm happy to see her too, because I hadn't seen her in a long time. She said, the one thing I'm never going to forget, and now she's an ancestor now, I'm never going to forget how you were my English teacher. Here you were a young woman teaching an older woman like me English. She just thought the world of that, you know, that somebody young is doing something for somebody old. And then, of course, we're growing up with somebody old doing something for somebody young. So I just, I just really treasured her. And you know, I would go and have business with her, and we would just keep that dream alive. And then with the work that I did with uh, uh, Sons and Daughters of Light, of course, I, when I went into the studio to do my own recording, I reached back. Um, I didn't think it was right that not only messages should never be recorded. So what did I do? I went and got Bull and Lane <laughs> and had him be my musical director on my project. And then he brought in uh, other musicians that we knew, including Nosey Bobo Bobo, who's a superb vocalist. But the other thing, a lot of people didn't know she was a bad bass player. So I had to have her on my project. And so we were able to get that project done. And then through this record company, they were able to get some things uh, recorded as well. And then um, the other thing is that uh, for East Palo Alto, um, we, um, I stayed on the board for a very, very long time. As a matter of fact, I think I uh, got up, was it last year, Lakiva? I think last year. Uh, because we were going to do a project and we didn't do that project yet, but this is an example of the kind of thing that we wanted to do as a legacy for the community, for Nairobi College. Um, so we never got a chance to do that, but in 2001, uh, when we found, we found out that we did happen to still be in existence as far as the world was concerned as an entity. And uh, the next thing we know, we're coming back into the fold of things is because we're winding up being contacted by this very institution wanting to buy property that we had. And so this is how we're able to have Eastside now because that property was sold and it put the Nairobi College back into existence. And to me, for this future, this is a sign to me that 
other things are going to happen, greater things are going to happen. I never did believe when we started talking about this reunion that this was just a time for us to get together, feel good, uh, look at everybody and talk about the good old days. It's good to do those kinds of things because that's part of us as a people. But the most important thing is what are we going to do beyond the feel good stuff? You know, we know we are living in times that need us so badly, you know. We, we never, we, well, some of us, we never went out of existence. We kept up. We were just, we may not have been in your circle, but that doesn't mean we weren't doing things other places. And so we still have that kind of work to do. And um, the last time we had this reunion, as a matter of fact, happened to be in uh, July 23rd and 24th, 2004. It was the last time we had a reunion. Um, so I'm very happy that we've had this time together and um, that we can do more and great things in the future. I'm looking forward to it. You know, there we got young ones behind us that need us. We got us that we still need each other. Um, we got our elders. They definitely still need uh, need us a lot. You know, so it makes me have really long, 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 long days. And sometimes it can go all over the place, kind of thing. But in the end, I'm just so honored that the Creator has endowed certain uh, skills and talents and gifts within me that makes it possible for me to be who I am. And I'm known as Portis Kalani Cheshire. Thank you. All right. Well, good afternoon. And uh, first, I want to. I want to thank Scott Cooper for inviting me to be part of the panel and uh, congratulate everyone who's been working on this. And I uh, also want to thank, him, uh, want to thank uh, Bob for giving me permission to sort of jump decades because uh, uh, my comment will sort of be framed in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, my experiences. But, you know, I, I remember hearing about Nairobi College uh, to some people I knew at DQ University around Davis, which was kind of a parallel effort uh, of American Indian and Chicano educators who were also had set up a, an independent uh, organization. There was a uh, Mr. Acevedo who uh, was on the board, and I used to work for an organization that was sort of connected to the farm workers um, and did education, adult education. Um, and it turns out he actually lived in unincorporated Menlo Park, so when I moved to this area, I ran into him again, oh, Dr. Acevedo, and uh, he's the one that uh, I remember him talking about Nairobi College. And prior to that, just as a reference, you know, when you go back in memory, all of a sudden you kind of remember things that maybe you didn't remember until you start thinking back. <laughs> and I used to work uh, for Upward Bound, uh, a period of time in South Central LA, and there was this one student whose name I do not remember, but he had moved from San Francisco to LA. And he used to talk about his power also sometimes. In fact, you know, he, he knew people or whatever. So, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, a few things, uh, you know, going back in, in this period of the late 70s, I, I had the opportunity one time to, a chance encounter with um, Ed Betts, I ran into him. I used to do some work with uh, the Campaign for Economic Democracy, which is sort of a movement within the Democratic Party. And there was some uh, gathering in the Mid Peninsula, and uh, that's when I first remember hearing perhaps a little more sort of uh, perspective on kind of what was going on in his heart or what had been going on. And, you know, certainly if you remember 1978 was the passage of Proposition 13, which we were working against. And unfortunately, that was the beginning of a, a certain cycle that has been very destructive, I feel, for uh, economic justice or economic issues in terms of what government uh, institutions can do uh, to serve that. But, you know, that's when I, I remember hearing, uh, like I said, a, a kind of a uh, overview, kind of a longer period, and you know, subsequently, I uh, I did I, I joined the uh, Apache committee, and I think that's when I ran into some some of you, uh, Nairobi, 
you know, definitely high energy activist. Shashet <laughs> 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 said it a certain way. He's called to his uh, attracts activists for some reason. I know, I know that my Nairobi movement had, had some uh, influence in that. You know, because uh, I know that. <clears throat> As soon as I moved to EPA, at the time I had my youngest brother living with me, I'm the oldest in my family, and I've always been part of my responsibility in a certain way. So he had started high school, and I showed up at the Revenue School District and said, you know, I'd like to volunteer. At that point, the first question they asked me was, do you speak Spanish? I said, yeah. I said, okay, well, we'll send you to Castaño School. And at the time, there was uh, starting to be a, uh, you know, a growth in the language minority population, Spanish speaking. Uh, Pacific Islander. So my background has been in education. In fact, um, in linguistics, I, I used to do some volunteer with DQ University at the time, as I mentioned, American Indian uh, Chicano focus in terms of the efforts to, uh, of, of, you know, some nations, uh, native nations, to recover the language, to revive it, to, uh, you know, have it come alive, and for the Chicano movement, it was more not to lose what you have, and, and that's that's always an issue. I think that it's still relevant, along with the, I think the you know culturally responsive uh, pedagogies, it's also linguistically responsive, it's just responsive to human beings, whoever they are, how they are. You got to do that. So I definitely appreciate um, you know those uh, those efforts that laid a foundation. Now, you know, very briefly, I remember uh, also uh, having a discussion one time with Omar Wally that, uh, you know, he, he probably doesn't remember. He talked to so many people, I think, during that time. But I was trying to, you know, find out more specifically about the movement for incorporation. And uh, I had met some of the Ben Seremos people, and I think that was probably the first time I had heard about Bob Hoover or what had happened, if you were mentioned what had happened at the at the community college, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, eventually some of them, I, uh, one of them was Jaime, uh, and uh, well, he's the one that I got to know a little more. Uh, you know, once we, we got really uh, in the early 80s into continuing the struggle to incorporate and, and really, uh, you know, became pretty intense, I would say, very intense period. Uh, during that time, I'm trying to convince some of the Benzeremos people like, you know, yeah, there's armed struggle, but right now we need to register voters, you know. <laughs> we, gotta go, we gotta go register people, so eventually it's, it's gonna come down to a vote. Uh, and some of those things, that is the way it happens, that, uh, you know, the, the, the people will speak through the votes. And so, um, yeah, so, you know, a couple of things that, that uh, sort of stood out for me uh, during this period of time was that uh, being part of the Apache and Corporation Committee, and I think that's where I first met, met you, Shashé, and, you know, you know, some of you, that I sort of took on the task. I think strategically, uh, you know, people on the committee, uh, we all had certain tasks that either, uh, it was clear that if nobody else did it, some of us had to do it. Uh, and whatever needed to be done, needed to be done. So, uh, partly by default, but also because I lived on the west side, I became a tenant organizer. And, um, you know, I literally, along with a few other people, we, uh, we visit every apartment on the west side probably two or three times. At the time, we're trying to talk to people about incorporation. One thing that stood out was that half of them thought they lived in Palo Alto. <laughs> and they would argue. And they would argue with me. They said, like, I'm sorry, you know, but we're in Palo Alto. And I said, yeah, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, the border, the border's really the creek, not the free. No, 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 we're in Palo Alto. So, you know, eventually, you know, they come around. But, you know, part of the reason they thought that is because many of the landlords would actually advertise it as Palo Alto. Yeah. So that we're not in Palo Alto. And um, so, you know, through that effort, uh, I think eventually we did, we did have an impact. And, and as you know, in, 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 you know, in the history here, uh, we had an election in 82 and we lost. And by the time 83 came around, where we, at the polls, we won only by 15 votes. Mm -hmm. And so, um, 
You know, it's been something that I've reflected a lot, uh, and, and uh, you know, I realize it, that there is an aspect always of a sort of political struggle that even internally sometimes we have to try to convince ourselves perhaps because the fact that it was so close, so close that, you know, it, it was just hard to understand, but obviously we were very happy that, that finally the community had reached that point where we could have more control over the destiny of the community because, um, you know, again, in, 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 our, in our meetings, uh, we, we, we didn't really com contemplate losing, you know. I think uh, you always have to, you also have to, always have to keep going no matter what, you know, win or lose. But the, the, the uh, so, um, so we, we, we uh, uh, you know, after we lost, uh, I was mentioning the 78, Prop 13, sort of the beginning of another cycle economically. Be becoming a, a, a tenant organizer for tenant rights on a much smaller scale than today, but what was happening here then, economically and politically, was uh, an effort to displace people through the housing crisis. Just between uh, Tagler and the Horvath brothers, I will never forget them. The Horvath brothers and others, I, uh, and Van Jetman, him I will never forget because he used to curse Barbara Mouton and Mrs. Oaks as we went door to door trying to re register to vote. So I thought it, that is so disrespectful, uh, but that, he didn't care. And that was the attitude that we got to get rid of certain people. And so, uh, by 1983, all the council member candidates, there were about 15, a large number of people, they all had to answer the question, what are you going to do about people being evicted for no reason? What are you going to do about all the rents being increased? You know, what are you going to do about the abuses of some managers? And so, you know, I'm mentioning that because that, that, that became the period when I think the community spoke in terms of making housing a very important issue at the core of our community because if you cannot state where you live then uh, you're going to be moved out indirectly by the market directly by certain people who find ways to get you out and so you know i i learned that very deeply personally just with neighbors until we became a city and we were able to adopt the law, uh, which was challenged. And then in 1984, we had a, an election. I, I was the person actually who coordinated it. And I'll say it publicly here. I, it took me many years to actually say it, but I actually coordinated the campaign for the rent law out of my apartment. Kind of underground, the landlords never knew. <laughs> so you know, so the, the uh, you know on the west side it was Lan Otterby's home and Diane Otterby's in my apartment where we basically ran the operation for it. In corporation, you know, so CDI was the center on the east side, right? Um, you know, we, I, well, so that really sticks in my mind because even today, as we know, it's still an issue of how um, in so many ways, so many people get displaced and often we don't even know it. We don't even know that it's happening and it's still an issue. So I, I feel very, you know, very good and very proud of having been part of that, that effort, along with other efforts to try to um, set a direction that would always be responsive to to the needs of the community first. I think as all of you have said, you know, try to, whatever we, whatever level we reach, educationally, economically, that uh, we have to keep instilling that in, in ourselves and in other people, that we have to give back to the community. We have to try to really hold that together. Otherwise, the forces are very, um, you know, very strong against that. So, uh, you know, those are some things I can share. I, uh, subsequently, uh, ended up also helping to coordinate the uh, 
the campaign for Jesse Jackson for president in, in San Mateo County. I was part of a statewide uh, Latino steering committee for Jesse Jackson. And that was also definitely a, uh, a very different kind of experience. You know, the first time that you have uh, uh, you know, an African American with, with a large campaign. I know that uh, uh, Chilson had run before. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, but Jesse Jackson actually came a lot closer than many people think, many realize. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, wasn't able to overcome a lot of barriers even within the, the Democratic Party. But he came and visited his Palo Alto too. So you know, along the lines of people um, coming uh, to to, uh, to this community. That, that you know we put up, we put up a fight uh, and you know we didn't win it but um, yeah so those are you know some things I'll share just from from my experience I, uh, I I I had a chance to write about ten years ago eight years ago some recollections of those areas around the uh, particularly the housing um, you know the housing issues that. Um, uh, that I, before I start forgetting things to us, I'm going to write down some of these things. And I think all of us need to do that, no matter what age, but it, it start slipping some things, you know, to, to, uh, to do that because, you know, it took us several years just to uh, sustain the, the city government, which became another tool that could be used to, to move the community forward. But we almost didn't make it, but, you know, here we are. And uh, I think the community has, you know, continued to thrive. There are obviously new challenges. Some of them are old challenges that get, you know, you know, they, they come around again. Some other ones are new ones. You know, the other thing I'd say is just that along with uh, sort of the tenant organizing that, that I was pretty heavily involved, we formed a group, um, East Palo Alto Council of Tenants, Later, Mr. Webster continued on. It's still around, not as active as it used to be. Uh, a few of us also formed a group called Comité Latino, which now primarily focuses on the Cinco de Mayo. But our job became to try to work with the Latino community. At the time, we were a smaller community because, uh, I mean, as you know, if we won by 15 votes, I think every single group within the Apache and all the networks around it uh, some people working with the business people, with the church people, with, you know, because we knew every single vote was going to count the second time around. And I know that, uh, you know, Mr. Rivera, who has passed on, Mrs. Ortiz, a few people that I had come to know uh, early on, was able to talk with them uh, and say, you know, we we need to we need to be supportive of this effort. I felt like. You know, since I talked to had talked to to Ed Bex, and then later to Omar Wallace, and like you know, I, I just thought at first you assume things. You know, I thought I thought it thought there was a city. I thought it was a city. You know, it turns out it wasn't. I thought, well, well you know, uh, anything I can do to help. So, um, anyways, once again, you know, thank you for the invitation. Amen. Congratulations. Okay. Uh, my name is David Rages, and um, I, 1970, I started working uh, in Nairobi schools, Nairobi Day School. Uh, I was, uh, I had just uh, dropped out of school myself, and I didn't know which way I was going to go, and. I got a call from Mrs. Wilkes and she asked me if I would uh, uh, be a substitute teacher at the Nairobi schools until one of the uh, teachers came back from maternity leave. And uh, it turned into a, a two and a half years uh, with the school there. Um, but it was, and I, as I mentioned before, I'm not going to be repeating, but um, it was one of the most busiest times of my life in terms of uh, just the requirements in terms of the responsibilities. Uh, if you have a classroom with, with children, then you're, you've got to lead them or push them in the right direction that they need to go. And uh, I, I learned uh, a lot about uh, the community because we use the community as our classroom, essentially. Um, 
there was no experience that you could where you could not gain some knowledge from. You know, and I uh, even in, in teaching, I uh, just thought of one thing with working with one of the students. Uh, there was a song out by the presidents called 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, Stephen used to sing that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, well, you know, you, you can learn like this. We can learn other things like this also, <laughs> using song, using music, using poetry, <laughs> using rhythms. And um, that was one of the ways that we were able to, you know, to, okay, this is no different. You can remember this. You can remember these songs, uh, these terms, these concepts as well. And that's what we focused on. Um, in, in trying to um, gain more respect for community, I, I, uh, the children took them out with video cameras. There was big, big giant video cameras in those days, you know, with the reel-to-reel uh, -reel, uh, black uh, videotape. But anyway, I would have to go out in the community and talk to the people on the street. And the whole thing was, well, you know, these people weren't born on the street. They wound up here some kind of way. It may be helpful. They can give you some information so that you will be able to avoid these pitfalls as they approach you maybe later on in life. And so those were the ways that we uh, were, were able to, uh, I, I guess, bring some something to the children that was a little it was a little unexpected the kids would not know what they were going to get when they walked in that classroom every morning that's how fluid we were and um i, I think it, it, it worked out pretty well i, I did i've gotten uh, some uh, positive feedback from from some of the, the kids and i, I just and I, and I hope even the ones I, did, I haven't heard from that they're doing very well. Um, but those were the, some of the most difficult times, you know, it's just trying to, um, you know, work within a community and provide for kids. You know they can learn, you know they're capable, but it seems like, you know, everything is leaning against them. And here you are on the other side pushing, trying to, you know, keep them going and pushing them in the right direction. And what I found out was that by uh, being spontaneous in a lot of ways really helped because what the kids would say, I, well, you know, I don't know what we're going to do today, but I can't wait to, to get started. You know, <laughs> or you know, and all the parents would tell me, well, so and so, she just can't wait to go to school in the morning. You know, and, and I and I would say, well, you know, the only thing is is that you know this the whole school school that this is our learning, our classroom, everything. You know, nature walks down running meat. Those were our, uh, there was so much to learn just from that, walking out to the bay, watching the tides rise and fall, things like that, that the kids, I said, we could, we could make every experience, everything we're doing, we'll make that a lesson that you can learn something from. And uh, anyway, that, that's for the two and a half years that I, that I worked at the Nairobi schools. Uh, those were the types of interactions I had with the kids. After I left the school, here we are, we're still in the 70s, and I, uh, I found that when I went back to school in Oregon, that I could apply the same thing, and it worked as well with the kids there. And, and, but the only thing was that I wasn't given the permission to do that. So it was a little harder to, you know, to, to get your lesson plans in, you know, or to be being questioned because well, you know, this is not what's in the book here, you know. And, but the one thing I did see was that in terms of the types of things that our children, our black children face, um, was no different. I, I um, met children who's, uh, who had been described as having edu uh, what kind of learning disabilities, uh, EMR, whatever they were called. And I would say, well, you know, th these kids, they're just like normal kids. You know, they don't have learning disabilities. They haven't had opportunity, you know. And, and plus, if you keep telling them that and treating them as such, you expect that kind of behavior, and this is what you get, you know. So um, I, I, that really opened my eyes in terms of how widespread, you know, the problems are or the challenges are with educating our children. 
And one other thing I, I want to do, I, I'm, if you don't mind, I would like to read something to you. Because uh, part of uh, me, my job at the uh, Nairobi schools was um, we, we would have uh, motivational meetings, or, or we sometimes just call it a regular staff meeting. But there were so many issues to deal with. There was so much, many stressors. Uh, sometimes people just needed to be able to, to vent. Mm -hmm. And so um, Ms. Wilkes always had a way of bringing it all together. You know, she would get up there and she would start talking. And by the time she finished, everybody was ready to go put in another two or three years at the school. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because it was, you know, that was the, the, how she motivated you. It was very, very energetic. And I just wanted to read something that, uh, these are from some notes that I took and then I kind of arranged, rearranged them, but essentially this is what she said. It's not how she said everything. But I'll just read this to you. Wanted, a place where black people can grow blackness out of the walls, the floor, the ceiling. We've got to have a place for us. We can't create on white folks' time. We must have a place to grow, to plan, to survive, to free our minds, to worry no more, to cry, to cry drip dry tears no more. Put our lives on the line for that. We must develop and create and shape ourselves. We must utilize our capability. We are capable to survive, to create, to better the lives, to enlighten the souls of black people everywhere. We gots to do it. Can't talk about it too much. We gots to do it now and stick with it and don't fail and give our lives for the cause of education, of freedom, of survival. If we must, if we must shed our blood for the sake of better education for black people, we must. Ain't no stopping once we start, cause we're doing this thing from the heart. If we dedicate, then we must work harder than a chain gang, stack the sandbags higher and higher as the waters of oppression rise. If we dedicate, then we must open our heads and take a look. Be on duty constantly. Black doctors are we, healers for a righteous cause. If we dedicate, then we must create the blueprints in our hearts and build with our blood and sweat. From one end of running me to the other, there's music in the air. There's getting the education in Nairobi. The trees are dancing, the birds are singing, there's music in the air. Somebody's learning at Nairobi. Breaking the barriers with sounds of song, there's music in the air. Don't have to sneak because there's freedom at Nairobi. So, That was the kind of motivation that I would get every morning going in there. But but I needed it because at, at the end of the day, it was gone, the, you know, the drain. It was nice to know that the next day you're going to go in and you're going to get motivated. And the songs we used to sing, like the, the Black National Anthem, we would sing that every morning. Um, there was a song called, If You Don't Want to Go, Don't Hinder Me, I'm On My Way. You know, um, um, all, a lot of songs were about learning. And, and uh, we sang them every morning. And it's amazing what that can do for you because I, I'm thinking now, when I was growing up, I learned songs in elementary school in German. I can still sing in German. I don't know what, a word about what they mean, but I <laughs> So I'm thinking, you know, if you can do that, kids can, they can do other things also. So uh, um, I, I am just thankful for the opportunity to have uh, had that, that experience of working for, with the, uh, for the Nairobi schools. And uh, I, I, it's something I will, I will never, ever forget, but I always will hold in very, very high esteem. And I just want to thank everybody. And thank you, Josh Che, for your poetry, because that was an inspiration also. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.